Hey, good morning, Father's House. Welcome to Sunday. We're so excited about service today. Uh, it's going to be a great one. My name is Josh. I get to be one of the pastors here on staff. This is Caleb. He's also on staff with us, one of the pastors. We are yep. so glad to be For here. For the record, I, I do know how to introduce myself, but it's just really weird to go right after that. <laughs> but jumping in, Josh, yesterday, you and I both happened to, in different places, both go on hikes. Yes. But I think we both had a similar experience in a short, concise sentence, what do you? What are your sentiments towards hiking? How was it? Uh, if I never have to go hiking again, I'd be happy. Uh, hiking, I, I just don't understand it. There's not much. It was very muddy because it's April, and the snow just melted. So you're literally trudging through mud, and we had a three-year-old and a five-year-old. They did better than me, to be honest with you, for I'm, being honest. I'm sure they did better than me, yeah. too. I went to Letchworth, and... I'm still in so much pain from the hike. But besides, maybe hiking <laughs> isn't the big happy news of our day to day. But there has been some incredible things that have happened this week. Um, and I want to give a shout out um, to Andrew Laturco and Josh, who just got their marriage license during the season, celebrating them. Incredible. There they are with their masks on and all their glory. We're just super excited, um, and it's really fun. Actually, we've got a really cool story about some people, and Josh, why don't you yeah. connect so, our dots? Yeah, Andrew is actually a nurse at U of R, and on Thursday, we interviewed some of what we're calling our TFH heroes, people who are working on the front lines during uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Andrew is one of those people, and then there was someone else in the in the call. His name is Mike Olson. Now, Mike Olson's a business owner, and you may be thinking, like, how is the business owner related? Well, Mike's uh, company manufactures packaging, and he was able to retrofit his entire uh, factory to make uh, face shields that U of R is currently using. They've made over 40,000 face shields, and the one that Andrew is uh, wearing earlier the day before our call was actually a face shield that Mike and his company created. So a lot of cool stories and interconnected things happening uh, with our church family through this pandemic, which has been really cool to see. And if you're new here, we want to welcome you. If you're on Facebook, why don't you click the links that are in the comments? We have hosts that would love to meet you. If you're on Church Online, there's this really cool banner that's going to pop up that says new here. Uh, I want to challenge you, click that. We would love to meet you, um, as that's what it looks like connecting in this season here on online. Yeah, and there's other ways you can actually share uh, what we're doing here. Uh, at the bottom of the screen on Church Online, there's a share button. You can share it to your Facebook, to your Twitter, anywhere we are on social media. You can actually share our stream on Facebook. You can hit the share button, share it with your friends, start a, a watch party, and watch it with some of your close friends. Awesome way to stay connected uh, throughout this time. And the, the screenshot we saw earlier, Josh, of your Team TFH Zoom, that was one of the many content that goes out every day um, in the week for, for here at the Father's House. Um, but why don't you tell us about one of the ones you got to do this week? Yeah, it was awesome. On uh, the Tuesday after Easter, we actually did our first online welcome party, which was an awesome way to get uh, people who maybe are new or newer to the Father's House, kind of connected with our story, what makes us unique as a church. We had a bunch of our staff on there. Our senior pastors were in on that call. It was an awesome opportunity for people kind of to see what makes the Father's House uh, the Father's House. We got to go through our story uh, and some of the, just the cool experiences We've had it at a church, things we value, things like that. So the welcome party is going to happen every month. So if you're new, you click that new here thing. We'll get you connected uh, with our welcome parties. And just a few shout outs. I want to I want to start with a really exciting one. Um, I don't know if you have you version on your phone, but if you don't, you have to download it. Um, our senior pastor has an incredible opportunity um, where he got to record some verses of the day and they went up on the app. Um, and today, one of those are playing. So if you go to YouVersion and you open it, you'll see um, a video from Pastor Pierre speaking to all those um, who go to YouVersion. Um, we even had a few people who went from YouVersion and found our stream first service. Um, it's just so cool um, the opportunities that he gets to do and helps connect and grow the influence of this beautiful house. Um, and another shout out um, of our Life Center food pantry that's been operating still during this season to find ways of helping and serving the needs in our community. This week, uh, I want to celebrate. It's right here. On Tuesday, they handed out 107 grocery bags. And on Saturday, an additional 154 grocery bags. Um, and that's going to those who can't afford, those who aren't able to leave their house, those who need help. We're able to serve the needs. Um, but we'd love your help. And you can help in two ways. Um, you can get together some non-perishable goods and drop them off at our prayer chapel. That's right across the street from our Chai Lai campus. Monday through Thursday, 9 to 2 p.m., the lobby is open for you to go in and drop those off. Um, or if you want to, you can consider going down to our Life Center 
um, and signing up so that we can make sure that we're able to pack those bags um, within the social distancing and regulations. Um, but just two really awesome ways of partnering with the Life Center. That's right. Hey, we're excited for today. If you've got kids in your living room right now, don't forget we have a kids experience just for them. You can click the link uh, on the Watch Online page. We're excited. We're starting a new series today called Anchored. So make sure you got your coffee with you and engage with the message.
Everything looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you Good morning, Father's house. I'm so glad that we get to be together this morning, just seeking after God and worshiping Him for His goodness and His sovereignty, His consistency throughout the ages. You know, God says that we should bring prayers and supplications to Him, and His promise is that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, it guards our hearts and guards our minds in Christ Jesus. Over the weekend, uh, we've received tons of prayer requests in various different categories, and you and I, we're going to join together. There's hundreds of us online from all over the Rochester area, New York State, um, our country, and the world, and we're going to join together in prayer for some of these needs. Firstly, we're going to pray for all of those in the medical profession that uh, potentially are exhausted right now. Um, they're caring for those who are sick and in need of, of healing. We're going to pray for those in the, the mental health field um, that are trying to hold things together. And with the um, increased amount of people that are stricken with anxiety and depression, we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for those that were in recovery, but because of the stressors that surround us in the world today, they've fallen back into addiction. Uh, we're going to pray for sickness and illness to leave bodies. We're going to pray for God's peace to reign. We're going to pray for wisdom. We're going to pray for the leadership of our country and of the world. Come on, I want you to join with me all over the Rochester area, all over our country and our world, and let's pray together to a God that hears us and one that answers prayer. God, we come before you, and we declare that you are king, that you are good. We thank you that you so love the world that you sent your one and only son. And we thank you that even in the midst of confusion and chaos, uncertainty, that the hope and gospel of Jesus Christ would continue to spread. Lord, we pray for those in the medical profession. We pray for endurance, pray for wisdom, health over them and their families. God, we pray for those that have been stricken with illness and disease. God, we pray for your healing hand to be on them. We thank you for your mighty angels that would surround them and your spirit of peace that would comfort them. God, we pray for those that are in the mental health field. We pray that you would give them wisdom and endurance to care for people. God, we pray for those that have fallen back into addiction. And God, we bind and we rebuke and we push away that spirit of addiction. And we say that it has not gripped you beyond the point where you can turn back to God, the one that would give you strength. God, we pray for those that are grieving and hurting right now. 
for the loss of loved ones. We pray that you would send your comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guard them, to hold them, to comfort them. God, we pray for all of us that we would increase in faith, increase in the neediness of your presence, of your peace in our lives. We thank you that we get to represent your goodness, your hope, and your joy in our situation. We thank you that you're good and that you're high and exalted over all things. So we continue to worship you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it is so good to be together. We know that distance may separate us right now, but church is not canceled. There are hundreds of us right now that are doing church together, right from your living room, your bedroom. Maybe you're still in bed, uh, but we're so glad that we're here at church. Uh, we want to welcome people from New York, of course, Pennsylvania, Florida, New Jersey, California, Virginia, uh, Georgia, Illinois, Ontario, Canada, okay, uh, Maryland, Ohio, Kentucky, Arizona, Iowa, Texas, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, North Carolina, South Africa, Connecticut, South Carolina. A couple shout outs for people individually. Christina Acholi. We got Mary and Dan with the new baby Tobias. Are they home? Are they home? Well, you guys home? I hope you're home. Uh, we got Orlando and Mabel, Stefan, Anaji, the presbyter. So glad that you are online with us. Uh, Aaron Johnson, Franklins, love you guys. Tony helped me with my haircut this week. Uh, social distanced, of course. 
uh, Rivaldo's speeches. Scott and Sarah Cameron, so glad that you're there. Scott, we are continuing to pray for you as you are in the medical profession. And uh, my favorite username of this service, so grateful and blessed, all combined, lowercase. You better pray for me because you got some powers in that. Patty Douglas, Kristen Davis, Luke Cassiselli, the legend. Hey, so glad that we are here, church together. Special shout out for Kim Rollins. It's her birthday today, so make sure that you are commenting. It's in the chat. Send her a text or a goofy video. Kim, we love you. You brighten our day. You have a deep uh, love for Jesus and his church. You're an incredible artist, uh, and you bring an enormous amount of care with everything you do, so we love you. We appreciate you as a church. Happy birthday. A lot of things are happening at church as you saw in the previous video, every single day or night, we as the church get to gather together. So make sure that you stay tuned to that weekly schedule tomorrow morning. I think 10 a.m. We're going to have some coffee and chats, just debriefing the weekend, setting us up for a great week. So make sure that you tune in on that on Facebook. Uh, Tuesday night, we got some youth stuff going on. Wednesday night live, of course, back down here in the Duplessis basement. We've been down here for, I think, five Sundays now. And um, it's great. Uh, we love it, but we miss just being together. Um, Thursday nights, we're celebrating TFH Heroes as well as we're going to start some parenting conversations. Friday night, Flashback Friday. Hope you tuned in this previous one. We got a lot of great messages coming up for you. Saturday morning prayer, and of course, here we are Sunday morning all together as a church. Hundreds of us online. And you know, there's a passage of scripture that, um, you know, I, I felt like uh, God uh, brought to my attention kind of when this whole thing started. And it's uh, one of my favorites, one of the first ones that I memorized when I got to know Jesus. It's out of the book of Philippians. I think it's going to be at the bottom of your screen. Philippians 1, 6 says, he who began a good work is faithful to complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. What I love about this scripture, and, and it's uh, being refreshed in my mind right now, is, is God, God was there in the beginning when you and I first maybe had, had faith. Uh, it came to the realization that God so loved us that he sent Jesus. And he who began that good work is faithful to complete it at the end of that day with Jesus. But the in-between time, that's what we're in right now. And that's where we get to partner with God. And um, the partnership looks a little bit different through crisis and challenge and celebration and mountaintops and valleys. But the partnership is unchanging, that we get to build this God dream together. And I want to celebrate all of those that are giving and continuing to tr contribute to the local church and everything uh, that we are able to do together as we partner with God. All the content, all of the food bags that are going out, the people that are being cared for, the medical and health professionals that are being encouraged, the small groups that are going, kids ministry, youth ministry. There is so much going on that we are partnering with God through our finances. Many of you got your first quarterly giving statement, and we just want to celebrate um, God's faithfulness through ordinary people like us in our continued giving. We celebrate you. We celebrate us as a church family continuing to do what God has asked us to do. And I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to pray really quick, and then there's going to be a really short video about a simple and secure way that maybe today you're going to start giving for the very first time. Let's pray together, and then we're going to give. God, thank you that we get to give to something so extraordinary, something that you started thousands of years ago. We get to continue the mission. Thank you that we get to partner with you, believing on your promise that you who began a good work, you are faithful to complete it. And thank you that in the in-between, we get to partner with you to further your gospel. In this uncertain time, more important than ever, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Check it out.
Good morning, everybody. So excited as everybody else has already welcomed you. And I just heard there's somebody tuning in all the way from Botswana. Oh, thank you so much uh, for tuning in and being part of this. We are so thankful. This is week five for us here. And, and there's a wonderful team practicing social distancing right here in my basement. And they're doing such a fantastic job. And I'm excited to start this new series uh, with us today. Uh, it's called Anchored because I believe more than anything else, um, what we are seeing is that a time of crisis uh, really reveals uh, us, um, how hearts, um, the temperature of our souls, and, and really how anchored we are, because ultimately our being anchored creates a, a peaceful cadence to our lives. And I'm going to pray for us, and um, I want to remind you, you are not online simply because. Um, maybe if you understand that God is, has purposed for you to hear, uh, not that what I say is the most important thing, but what the Holy Spirit will cause you to hear today for your life. So I encourage you, don't um, create this conversation as one of many um, for the next 15 minutes or so. I'm going to do my utmost to get as close as I can to your heart and just to have an honest conversation. Let's pray, shall we? Holy Spirit, you are forever faithful. And Jesus, your love is new every morning. And Father, you are a good, good God. In the midst of it all, you are good. And I pray that as we step into this conversation, I thank you that the entrance of your word brings life, hope, healing and grace and god may we hear what you are saying to each of our hearts here today in jesus name amen so i want to read to you a portion of scripture and um, this portion of scripture really i um yesterday i stumbled across this portion of scripture which oh it's i think it is such a great message but it is a start to a conversation that is going to continue because it's in the book of Acts chapter 27, verse 27 through 32. And it goes like this. Paul is writing, he says, About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, think about it, 14 days of storm on a wooden boat, right? As we were being driven across the sea of Adria, the sailors sensed that land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. So they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the sailors cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. Why, Why is those so important? There's a couple of things in this that, um, that kind of drew my attention. First of all, storms. It is only inevitable that you and I will go through storms we cannot control, uh, the winds, the tides, and the rage of it all. But what was interesting about this is that the storms and the winds and the tides will always threaten to shipwreck our lives. But these sailors did something phenomenal. They threw out four anchor lines. And anchors is speaking of something that holds you to something that's immovable. In other words, once the anchor lines are set into a solid foundation, the boat is safe, right? And what they did is say, now that the boat is safe, let's pray that the storm will blow, uh, blow over. But it's interesting, in the midst of a boat that has been anchored and people praying, some still wanted to abandon the ship out of pure anxiety and fear. And I want to say this to you. Whenever you and I go through storms in life, there are two things that we have got to do. We've got to ensure that our anchors 
are in something immovable, unshakable. And the only immovable, unshakable thing there is, the Bible says it's the oath and the promise of God that is anchored to the throne of the living God. And the second thing I want to say is that you've got to pray in the storm and in the season of the storm. And the third thing is don't abandon the boat. Don't move out of your relationships. Don't disconnect from the church community that you are part of because it's within the, the community of believers, connecting to that community, being anchored in God and praying. It is in that that our lives will be preserved. But now, this is what I want to share with you. Because you see, Paul, who we were just speaking about in the storm, when when you hear about his life, his ministry, it's sobering because he's been ship, shipwrecked many times. He's beaten. He was, he was um, uh, stoned and left for dead. He f was fighting off robbers, fighting off thieves, fake brothers, betrayal. The list goes on and on. And now we find Paul. He's in Rome under house arrest. 24 hours a day, he is chained to a guard. Listen, there's accusation against him, and some of it's brought by the very church in Rome that is against Paul. Not everybody is even for him. He's not allowed to speak publicly, and he is waiting for the outcome or the verdict to the accusations, and one outcome may be that he will be executed and he will lose his, his head. Literally, they will execute and kill him. Now, that sounds to me like a storm. But what was so intriguing for me about this, in the midst of the very scenario that I sketched for you, he is writing the book of Philippians. Now, the book of Philippians is so interesting because it's referred to as Paul's personal manifesto on how to live a life full of joy. Wait. Like, I go like, what? I'm chained to a God. The reward for ministry is that I may lose my head. The, the people that I just preach Christ to is turning against me. I can't even preach. And now I'm going to sit down in the midst of uncertainty. And I'm going to write a manifesto on how to be joyful in the midst of a storm. Because Philippians, and we're going to look more into this, is dripping with phrases like, I Always pray with joy. I rejoice. I will continue to rejoice. Be glad and rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. And, and, and when I read that, I go like, okay, Paul, it's because you're not married. That's why, that's why, that's why. But that is not it. Because you've got to understand the weight of what can happen to him and how important he is in the mission of, of preaching the gospel of Jesus. So why is he not writing on prayer strategy in the midst of uncertainty? Why is he not writing on hope in the midst of this? Why is he writing on joy in the midst of this? Now, could it be that joy, deep inner joy, is the buoyancy that carries us through hard times? Think about it. I'm going to say it again. What if inner joy is a buoyancy that carries us through hard times? Now, let's just be honest. We've been in this very interesting season worldwide for now for five weeks. I don't think there is a country in the world that's not feeling the effects of it. My, my parents in South Africa, um, they, they were halfway through 21 days of lockdown when they announced another 21 days and things look very different all across New York. So many people um, have suffered such great loss and we are in homes and we've never been um, together for so long. But in the midst of a crisis, we are not made, we are revealed. I shared that with you and this is very important for you to understand. Whenever we are revealed, it's always met with the grace of God. God never reveals us to judge us. He reveals us to shape us, mold us into the image of his son. In the midst of this crisis, what, is, what have you seen in you? That you go like, oh boy, well, I can be honest with you. I have been very, very frustrated in this crisis. 
I, I cannot tell you this. Every day I wake up and I'm like, oh, I want to wrestle a bear. I want to shoot something, kick something, do something. It's like, ah, oh, what is going on? And, 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 and it's so interesting that I'm quite disappointed in myself in a way because I thought that there was going to be praise coming out of me and gratitude coming out of me. And, and we're still in New York in the mornings when I wake up, my eyes go to the window and when there's no sun and we have been with no sun for a very long time, it gets so cold here. I go like, oh my God, really? Really? Today is terrible. And my wife will always arrest me and go like, really? Are you going to let the sun or not the sun for the next half an hour determine the, the very condition of your soul. And then I'm so embarrassed because I don't want to acknowledge that that's what I'm doing. So in the midst of this, what has been what you have been seeing in yourself? Because here is one thing I can tell you, that joy changes whatever that is. In the book of Nehemiah, we see that they've just completed a very hard task of rebuilding the wall with a lot of opposition and the people are tired and Ezra is reading the law and they realize how far they've stumbled from God in the midst of this. It says in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 and he says, do not be worried for the joy of the Lord is your strength and your strong tower. Think about it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now Jesus his mission was hard. It wasn't easy. He, he, he fought the visible and the invisible forces of life. His mission, his assignment, he could not fail. And the Bible says he was a man acquainted with sorrow. Yet, listen what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9 says. You love justice and hate evil. Oh, I, I read it this morning again. It really touched my heart. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O oh God... Your God has anointed you, watch, and pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. The Father poured out an oil, one translation says, of extreme joy and gladness on Jesus. It seems the harder the situation the more anointing of joy carried him through because the Bible says, the joy that was set before him is what gave him the courage to go to the cross. So in the midst of uncertainty, how, how did Paul write this overflowing joy? How did he do it? How did he not worry about the outcomes? Well, the, the secret to his joy, there are two words that come up again and again. The word mind come up ten times and the word think five times. So I can simply say this. And we're going to talk more about it next week. First of all, if we want to be people that live with joy in the midst of challenging situations, first of all, what we believe is critical. What we are anchored in in our belief is critical. And Paul was anchored in a belief. And we're going to touch on one of those. Secondly, the way he applied his mind to what he is meditating on what he is thinking on, how he is metabolizing the world around him in his mind. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Because you see, I don't know if you've experienced this, and I'm sure you do, uh, that carrying joy sometimes is like carrying water in a, a rusted bucket. It, it feels like we can contain it for a little bit, but when we turn our back, the bucket of joy is empty again. I know a few people in life that's always happy. They're always happy, and, and I love those kind of people, but they irritate me because I want what they have. I'm constantly thinking, what are they not seeing? Because it is so attractive to have an enduring, buoyant heart and spirit that lives that. I can tell you that 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Let joy be your continual feast. Think about it. If God's will for you and I to have joy being our continual feast, then I go like, what are we missing? What are the holes in my bucket? And I'm going to give you four that I'm guilty of every single time. And I'm praying in the season, God, show me how to close those so that I can walk in my home with an enduring joy. The very first thing is when our joy is connected to circumstances. Now, we'll never say it. 
But how often have you heard this and believe this? If things can just go my way, I'll be so much happier. <laughs> a lot of you that are married young, silently, you have a prayer every night. God, if they can just think like me. God, if they can just be like me. Life will be so amazing. I've got good news and I've got bad news. You can have a happy marriage. The moment you stop trying to make them like you, because you're not part of the Trinity, okay? We all need to change and understand we are not the status quo of normal and perfect. And it's interesting the if only, then I, if only, then I, if only this, then I, if only that, then I, if only he, then I, if only she, then I. The then and the I becomes this condition and outcome that we think if we, then we will. And I'm here to tell you that is not true because you cannot control the weather. My wife told me that. You cannot control traffic. You cannot control people. You cannot control what people say. You cannot control how long the lockdown is going to be. You cannot control these things. So if none of these things are going to play out, can you be joy, have joy in a season of uncertainty? Listen, the poet Byron said this, men are the sport of circumstances. I love that. Men are the sport of circumstances because Paul was in the worst kind of circumstances, yet he was writing a letter and living a life of saturated joy. The second one is people. I, I love the story of a young girl that climbed off the bus in her teenage years and She's right now, she's a prima donna. She is a little princess. She comes off the bus and she slams the front door and she shouts, people, 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 people. And she went, goes to her room and slams shut the room. And, and her mom gently go up and knock gently on the door. And she says, honey, can I come in? And she goes like, no, go away. She tried again with a gentle spirit. Honey, can I come in? No, go away. Why can't I come in? Because you're a people. People are my problem. I can tell you this. There is not a single person in this world that can be a sustaining factor of joy in your life. Listen, people can make me more happy, but they cannot make me happy. My wife can add to my happiness, but she cannot be my happiness. Your spouse can accelerate your happiness, but they cannot be the fire that stokes the happiness in your life. Listen, people are going to do what they're going to do. They're going to say what they're going to say. They're going to be what they're going to be, and they're going to disappoint you. And can I tell you something? You are a people too, and you will disappoint people. And you, me, I have been the center of many people's unhappiness, unaware. That's why we cannot have people be the anchor of our joy. Here's the third thing, and I'm going to tell you one more after that, and then I'm going to leave a big old bombshell with you. Are you ready? Don't go away, okay? Here's the th third thing, and that's things. Possession. I, I read the story and thought it was rather cute. Abraham Lincoln was walking with his two sons, and both boys were crying and bickering, and somebody says, hey, Mr. Lincoln, wh why are the boys crying? He says, I've got three walnuts, and both of these boys want two. They are fighting to have more than the other. Hey, I'm guilty of this. How often do you go online and you think, if I just go to Amazon and just buy a few things, I'll be so happy, right? And after the boxes arrive, you have buyer's remorse, and you realize that no amount of anything I buy is going to bring me happiness. As a matter of fact, the more you have, the more you've got to manage, the more you've got to keep. And you will find out with more comes more, and more is not happiness. Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus is speaking, and he says this. Speaking to the people, he went on, he says, take care. Protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. We, we believe Scripture, but it's hard to live it because somehow Jesus is saying, whatever possessions you have on earth, it's not safe. It will not last, and it will never satisfy. Can I tell you something? The one thing that I am super thankful for in this season is that the God of this world, money, is getting a knock in the teeth like never before. And we are all feeling it. We're all paying the price of it. And I promise you God's going to be faithful and restore. But if ever there is a time 
where the lesson should be learned that you cannot trust in money. You cannot trust in what you think you're going to have tomorrow. God is our only source that is eternal, unshakable, unmovable. That's why let's not bank in things. Whatever you owe today or whatever you possess today is only in your hands for a moment. Let it be part of your joy, but it will never give you sustaining joy. So here is the last one. Worry. Worry. You know what worry is? Worry is the silent voice begging for control. That's what it is. Worry. If anyone had some real worries, it's Paul. Because he's in house arrest, chained to guards around the clock, waiting for a verdict. Knowing that he's got no church family opening a GoFundMe page to get a high-powered lawyer. And yet, he is unworried. Yet he is, he actually tells us in chapter 4, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be worried. And I go like, wow, Paul, if you only understand, because worry is the, the voice that plays out the worst scenario. And the worst scenario on the worst scenario on the worst scenario on the worst scenario on the worst scenario. Not understanding that our God always, listen to me. Your worst nightmares never will play out if you keep yourself anchored in Jesus. So here is the thing I want to leave with you. Not only are there these holes in the buckets, but Paul had fundamental anchoring places in his belief. And I'm going to leave one with you. I'm going to open the conversation. And from our last service, I can tell you it kind of puts a fire raging because this is a hard one. Because ultimately, there is the distinct foundational belief that Paul had in the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? The sovereignty of God means who is in control of things. Now, let me ask you this. Do you believe that God is in control of all things. Wait, don't answer too quick. Don't. Don't. Because I had to ask myself that question. Of course I'm going to say, absolutely. Then I'm thinking, the implications of that means that when bad things happen because of free will, do I park a drunk driver that takes out a life at the feet of God? And I go like, no, 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 no. I cannot do that. But then, does he control all things or some things? And if he controls some things, then I feel a need to control the things that God doesn't control. Now, the question is, what are the some things? Now, I sit back and I go like, I don't know what are the some things. Which means, now I feel even a greater burden to control more than I think I should control, just in case. That's not part of God's sovereignty and control. Now, I know your mind's going a million miles an hour. Listen, we're going to talk about it next week. But this is what I want you to understand. That the answer to that question is very complex. But the interesting part to that whole discussion, it's almost the, the pitiful picture. I don't know about you, but hey, when I was growing up, do you know that we're allowed to sit in the front seat of the car without any seat belts as little kids? Yep. Yep, we did. We did. And then you would get these fake steering wheels that, with a big old sucker that gets put against the dashboard of the car. And, and you as a little kid would be driving the car, right? And you would sit there fully, fully, fully persuaded, fully persuaded that you, you are steering this big old vehicle. But if you look to the left, um, you will realize the one who's steering it is not you. And I think what is so interesting, feverishly, controlling, demanding, manipulating, totally convinced we are controlling everything around us. That is an absolute belief that God has zero control. And that's not what we see with Paul. And we're going to be exploring this next week because I believe that once we begin to understand, minutely understand that God is watchful 
Oh, oh, David says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of the heavens of the earth. He never gets weary or tired. And he doesn't even take and sleep at night. Uh, the one that watches over us is faithful and is true. So this is what Paul ends with. I love this. Because you see, church, there are three things that I would love for you to practice this week. Right standing, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those three things are the temperature of God's kingdom. But we cannot get to peace and joy without being in right standing with God because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And joy, we will find out the source is not in things. It's in Him. It's His joy. And this is what Paul is writing in chapter 4. He says, therefore, do not be anxious about anything. But everything and anything that you are, bring it to God through prayer and supplication. Make it known to Him. Then He says this, when you pray about those things that you feel is out of your control, then the God of peace that surpasses all logic and all understanding shall mount God and garrison over your hearts and minds in Christ. A peace from heaven. And once peace comes, Joy is a product that will follow the peace of God, which all comes from right standing with Him. So in this moment, I want to read one last uh, quote from Spurgeon. He says, God is too good to be unkind. He is too wise to be confused. And if I cannot trace His hand, I can always trust His heart. Isn't that powerful? Now I would love for you to sit back. Don't tune out yet. I would love for you to listen to this beautiful song. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to pray with you. I so deeply appreciate you staying with me today and hearing this message.
So Jesus said these words, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart and maybe in this season of extreme uncertainty. All the busyness of life has been floundering around you. And once again, there has been enough quiet around you to hear his voice. His voice is always inviting, always welcoming, just like the prodigal father waiting for his prodigal son. Um, every day, his kindness and grace waiting. New, new robe, a ring of sonship. And I would love to invite you. If you feel that your heart has been drifting from God, maybe intentionally, unintentionally, or Maybe you've never said yes to the heart of love of the living God. I'm going to lead a very simple prayer. You see, it's not in the prayer you pray as much as the heart towards the heart of the living God. Right where you are, if you want to just put your hand on your heart, if that's you, just whisper this prayer with me. Jesus, I hear your voice and I'm coming home. I believe you're the Son of God that died for my sin rose from the dead create in me a clean heart renew in me a steadfast obedient spirit make what is dead alive in me thank you that you're a promise keeper thank you if you said if I come to you you will never push me aside and all who receive you will become children of God. I will never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. May God bless you. And we can't wait to be with you next Sunday. Listen, we're going to talk about that sovereignty thing. And three other things that Paul fundamentally was anchored to that I believe is so critical for our lives. God bless you. We deeply, deeply love you.